Okay. <coughs> Our next speaker is Mr. John Roach, Executive Director, Technology Services for the Foundation for California Community Colleges. Since 2003, Mr. Roach has led the development and operation of statewide web-based tools used to manage more than 70 million square feet of college facilities and to access demographic geospatial data using planning and the operating and operating the colleges. In 2011, working with Onuma Inc., he integrated two of these systems with web-based building information modeling, the resulting fusion GIS and Anuma collaboration platform allows facility data to be combined with campus maps and 3D building model. This platform is used for analysis and project execution across facility life cycle, from campus master planning to detailed design construction, facility maintenance, class scheduling, space utilization, and energy monitoring. I first met Mr. Roach at the BIM Storm for Healthcare and Education owner in December 2011 and was blown away by the presentation he gave on Fusion. It's a privilege to have Mr. Roach with us today to talk about his experience from an owner's perspective for embracing integrated web-based tools to maximize efficiency in facility lifecycle management. Please welcome Mr. John Roach. Thank you. And thank, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. But I first want to let Kimon set the stage a little bit because I haven't been able to participate in the earlier part of the, of the meeting today, and I apologize for that. I had hoped to be here for the full day. But Kimon will start with a few words, you know, setting the stage, introducing uh, some of the, the uh, work on, on a broader scale. I'm, I'm excited, though, to share with you the work we're doing at the community colleges and how our districts are using this new platform uh, for a whole range of activities across the life cycle. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jun, and thanks the uh, HBC for having us here. They're very excited to uh, explain what's been going on because we're very excited about what's going on at, at, at the state level with Fusion, CCC, GIS, and Onuma. Uh, this is something that's happened actually very rapidly. It's, it, the, at the, pa the pace that this actually got implemented is actually surprising to all of us in many ways. And there are a lot of really good reasons why it went that way. And this is a little, little background of what this is all about. A lot of the discussions in the last few days and this morning about blue dot, purple, red dot are very relevant to what we're going to be showing you because it's really about moving the data all the way from early planning into facility management. But not only that, more importantly, managing existing facilities, which the state has 71 million square feet, uh, 5,000 buildings, a lot, a lot of, a huge amount of data. So I'd like to set the stage by saying <clears throat> the technology exists today to manage massive amounts of data. It, it creates revolutions. It, it gives interfaces to users that know nothing about the technology in the background, but allows them to make decisions uh, with smartphones, to communicate with others. And it's really that connection capability that's really exciting about all of this. And the standards and interoperability, I'm very involved with standards organizations, and but for example, the World Wide Web has standards of how things connect on the internet. Um, the McKinsey report that was put out last year talks about big data and the growing pot potential, the frontier about big data and a lot of information driving innovation. Uh, talks about the, the, the industry of mobile phones and how things are changing. So everything about our world is changing. We all know that. We've seen what's happening with tablets and smartphones and, and the discussion about where the desktop is going. So where do we fit in as an industry? In the big data report, it shows which parts of the industry have the most potential for growth and the use of big data. Unfortunately, the construction industry is pretty much dead last, and we all know the reasons of why that is. This is a very bad thing, but it's also a huge opportunity for us if we can figure out how to harness the information that comes from our projects, our buildings. Um, Renee the other day also talked about standards and railroads and, 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 and uh, containers. And I use this slide to kind of talk about, yes, there are many ways of getting from point A to point B. You can have a cargo ship moving a lot of data across or a lot of products across. But you can also move from point A to point B on a jet ski. In many cases, it's more efficient to go by jet ski than a cargo ship. So it's not always one way. Every way is valid. And the, 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 the goal here is really to find out what makes the most sense. 
I always start my presentations with this slide, too. It's If you go on the Internet today, you can make an airline reservation in real time. It gives you a bid in real time. And you can try many iterations of it. And there's a huge amount of data in the background, but you're kind of giving your input, and it gives you simple output. You don't have to understand the technology in the background. It doesn't ask you how much fuel would you like on the plane. You don't go to this and create a file that you save on a server. You don't create a PDF file or even an Excel file of today's flight schedules because they're obsolete the minute you print them. And this works very efficiently. It's obviously been going on for many years. Uh, you're not asked about, do you want to reserve a pilot seat? So there's rules built into this decision-making process. How much fuel would you like on the plane when you reserve that seat? There's a lot of data that's relevant to that user's perspective, and that's very important to think about passenger pilot and engineering, their points of view, and we heard a little bit about that this morning from a point of view of an owner and an architect and a facility manager. We all might be talking about that same building or that same portfolio, but we have many different needs of that data. How do we use it? So another very important concept, we're, I'm an architect as well, so I'm very into very detailed models for BIM. We've been using BIM since 1993, actually. So it's very important to us to have these very complex models with clash detection. I think the industry is pretty much nailed, not nailed completely, but it's moved very rapidly in using that complex data. But it's also critically important to understand that in a lot of cases, you don't want all of it. When you're reserving your flight schedule, you don't download the engineering documents of the plane. Even architects use even Frank Gehry uses building blocks to simplify the program requirements, for example. Another very interesting concept, there's a Forbes article that says, now every company is a software company. And what it says, Ford sells computers on wheels, FedEx boasts developer networks, and the last line is, and those who fail to adopt right now will soon find themselves obsolete. The era of separating traditional industries and technologies industries is over. In other words, we're all processing information. We have to think of ourselves as creators of data and even creators of tools and interfaces that allow us to get to the data. The Coast Guard in 2006, we've been working with them for many years, said the data about our facilities is more valuable than the physical facility itself. In other words, throughout the life cycle, the actual cost of construction of a building is insignificant to the valuable information about the facility that drives the operations of a business. And we heard some themes of that this morning as well, too. So the Coast Guard, for example, we, we prototyped, did a lot of pilot projects with them of how do you connect data about BIM to making decisions about how, how do you act as a Coast Guard? How do you protect the West Coast, for example? How do you get aircraft in the air? How do you have buildings that support aircraft? Things like that. So everything is interconnected. It sounds incredibly complex, but there are simple ways of, of making this happen. And that's kind of where I'm heading with, with the fusion uh, uh, discussion that we're going to have this morning. John will show a little bit more about that. Uh, Fusion is a program that's been running before we met John for many years. It's about facility data with no BIM. And I'll let John go into more details about that. So there's tabular data on the web, 5,000 buildings, 120,000 spaces, etc. So how do we take that? And what we did, our, we have a tool called the Onuma system. It's one of the tools that we use. It's a web-based building information modeling tool that's used by GSA and Coast Guard and and the state of California, other architects and engineers. It's uh, uh, in the cloud. You don't install any software. You log in and you start working with it. So there's data you can get to. You can open it up on a smartphone. Simple interfaces to complex data in the background. So what we did is we took this system and connected it to the Fusion data. So Fusion is a database on the web. We're an interface on the web. And we did some prototypes of how do we export data from Fusion and import it to the Onuma system and see that data. That was the first prototype that we did for one campus. Then there was discussions, okay, let's go to two pilot projects. And I said, okay, if we're going to do two, we might as well do all 5,000 buildings in one shot. And the way that we did that is we said, okay, what's called web services. Just like data about airline scheduling populates that Expedia interface with no import or export. It's, just, it's subscribing to Delta schedules and those chains of flight price of flight, flight change on minute by minute or second by second. So we're subscribing to Fusion data. We're not importing, a very important point. We're not exporting from one tool and importing to another tool and having two different data sets. We're saying we want information about facilities and spaces and condition of buildings. You maintain that and we want to see it in a BIM. So a as we subscribe to that, we had a, a, what we call the low level of detail model populating the entire state. They also have a GI ArcGIS server running so we're able to, to locate the buildings. And then as new buildings came in, we started replacing those with more detailed models. 
So the significance of this is as data changes, you don't have to save a new BIM. And at any point in time, I can click a button and export an IFC file or a Revit model or a SketchUp model. It builds it on the fly. It says, okay, you want to a BIM of this building, let me go and get all the data that we have about the condition of this building, output it as an IFC file, and then you can take it out to your other BIM applications. So it creates an interface to self-populate and manage the very complex data, which if you imagine, it's absolutely impossible to think of a world where you have 5,000 BIMs and you're managing those one by one, or you're managing them as a bunch of files. We're there today as an industry, but if it's going to transition. If we think of data, in a way that can start populating and creating things and connecting to other tools. And you'll hear more a little bit about that later as well, too. So here's some of the screenshots of the interface of the Onuma system looking at fusion data, color coding spaces. None of these floor plans are saved as a file. They're built on the fly from the database. Even the size of the room can be changed, for example, if you say you're going to do a renovation. And we're up to, there's 72 districts. We've gone through many different campus sites, uh, VBN, Rob, who's up here front, up, up front and center here, is uh, going to talk a little bit more about what he's doing right now as an architect and planner with this data. We've had uh, Balfour Beatty at Riverside College taking as-built BIMs and importing the Revit model back into the system to submit back to the owner. So this is already happening. It's not stuff that we're saying is going to happen in the future. The technology is there today to figure out data that is relevant to an owner, taking it out from a BIM and putting it back into a server like this. A lot, a lot going on, a lot of different campus sites. We'll be opening this up live in a, a little bit here and show you some more details. But um, John will come up next and talk a little bit more about that. And one more thing. I, I guess, just want to yeah. make sure this stays okay. away. Okay, okay, good. Uh, we're also working with several owners. GSA is one of them, where we wrote a specification of how facility data needs to be formatted in BIM and in databases to be delivered to GSA. And there's a specification that says, here's the type of information we need. We worked with uh, Broadison Associates on this and created the specification also for LACCD and Pankow Construction actually took that specification, modeled their data in it, and brought it back into the, the Onuma system, which then goes back into Fusion. So John, why don't you come up here and give us a little bit more deeper dive about Fusion, and we'll jump back into a little bit more live on the Onuma side after that. I had a wonderful introduction, so let me skip the, the uh, title slide here and tell you briefly what I'd like to cover today, tell you a little bit about the California Community Colleges and the Foundation, and then briefly introduce you to the three main pillar applications that we've linked together. As Kimon pointed out, we haven't, we haven't uh, subsumed any one of these in the other systems. We've, uh, we've intentionally kept them independent, but linked them together to extract synergies and, and overlaps of the data layers that each can provide. Then I'll uh, follow on with a brief slide to set up some of the other information I think Kimon will be sharing afterwards about specifically how my college districts have started using this uh, in a, in a uh, you know, past our pilot stage, how they've actually been rolling it out for master planning and other activities, and wrap up with a brief introduction, a, a reminder of why this works the basic principles that we've followed uh, that, have been, that have been fundamental to our view of how the data needs to link even before we met Kimo. And part of the, what was so wonderful about this partnership is we already shared a uh, common theme, common ideas in place. This diagram will come up uh, several times in my presentation. I use it as a touchstone because it, it emphasizes the point that I've already made once. And that is we are not um, overtaking different systems we're creating collaborative connections. We're asking the, the authors, the authoritative sources of individual data sets to maintain their data and share summary or detail um, broadcasts of it through, through web services so that we can inter interlink the, the platforms. And in doing that, we take the three systems that we have immediately at hand and then start combining with other partners, other vendors, other local data sets that one district may have, but others do not. And from that, we get this, this collaborative platform that's much more powerful than the individual uh, standalone elements. Briefly, a little bit about the California Community Colleges. Come on, has already covered much of this, but we are the largest higher education system in the nation. We have uh, 72 districts covering most of the land area in the state, over 5,000 buildings, 71 million square feet. We serve uh, between 2.5 and 2.75 million students per year. 
the foundation for California Community Colleges is, is the official nonprofit that serves uh, the, the um, Board of Governors of the California Community College System as well as the statewide chancellor's office. And we, in that capacity, we're a private nonprofit. We can serve the uh, mission of the California Community Colleges in a unique way that supports all the entire statewide system. My role is in the technology realm, and, and technology has been a fundamental part of, of the foundation since its founding in 1998, ever since some of the early college wise innovation that we did with Microsoft to distribute education software. And while Fusion, CCC, GIS, and UMA uh, is, is a very exciting component, it's just one in, in the string of things that we've been working on and we're, we're very proud of. Now, a little bit about Fusion. Fusion is this facility maintenance and reporting tool that's on the web. It's been in place since 2003. It is uh, a series of interlinked modules represented by the tabs across the, the top of the screen that allow for the sharing of, of data that's submitted by the states and, and reviewed by the chancellor's office. So it contains not only the data and the tools to update it, but also the workflow elements that allow the districts and the chancellor's office to work back and forth. Fusion is owned by the districts. It was the vision of, of uh, Fred Harris at the Chancellor's Office, who's in charge of, of facilities, and 16 districts that saw the benefit of bringing this, this uh, facilities management reporting task together in a central database. They contribute to, contributed the original seed money for development. Fusion is now uh, operated and maintained through annual contributions from all 72 districts. It's used statewide. It is the system for reporting facility maintenance for 71 million square feet of space for the colleges. Again, Fusion is the first pillar application here that I want to talk about. It uh, provides this, this uniform central database that allows for the centralized reporting that I've already shared. And the next several slides will introduce the basic workflow that's in Fusion. I don't want to spend a lot of time with this, but Fusion is a huge repository of data that's been, that we've had since 2003 and that we update annually. And that's, a, that's been a key benefit for us to be able to roll out the Fusion GIS and NUMA platform in such a big way. I encourage people that are thinking about doing similar activities to not be constrained by thinking they have to have all the data up front. But we had a great head start because we'd already been working on, on maintaining this reporting, reporting this data in tabular form. So in Fusion, there's a series of workflow elements that uh, form a, a cycle starts with the space inventory module. Annually, the districts report on changes to the room level for each of the uh, buildings and rooms on each of their campuses. It includes square footage, uh, student station counts, how many seats are in the room. It includes room use codes, such as top codes, which is a taxonomy of program or, or a room use identifying an academic area. Also talks about whether what type of space it is, whether it's a lecture or lab space. In addition, we have facility condition assessments that are updated once every three years. I have a small team of assessors that are on the road 26 weeks out of the year uh, assessing buildings and maintaining that database continuously, giving us a system level uh, apples to apples comparison of the condition of buildings uh, throughout the state. And that only not, not only provides the district managers with information about each of their buildings to give them a, a means to compare and prioritize which buildings are going to get the next little bit of funding that comes in. But it also gives the statewide chancellor's office an ability to equitably compare uh, needs across the state. The assessment is uh, a key piece of the assessment is we not only tabulate individual deficiencies, but it also includes building replacement costs. So we can compare the sum of all deficiencies to the, the cost to replace the building and get a facility condition index. Next step in the workflow is the enrollment forecasting. Each year, the district office uh, enters into Fusion their estimate for enrollment forecast for each district. The districts then are responsible to go into Fusion and take those enrollment forecasts and allocate them out across their districts and, and then extrapolate for further for out years. And it's with, with those first three building elements, or those first three pieces of the workflow, the space inventory telling us what space we have, the assessments telling us the condition of the space, the enrollment forecast telling us what future demand we're going to have for students in our case. The districts then have the, the building blocks they have to enter the construction planning phase. 
And in uh, the planning module of fusion, districts go through a, a whole series of, of planning steps, developing initial project proposals and submitting and reviewing those. The next year, updating those to final project proposals. Each time, the workflow elements are going back and forth between the districts and the chancellor's office staff that are responsible for approving them. They can keep track of uh, dialogue back and forth about uh, other submittals that are needed. There's a whole series of forms that are included that keep notes on, on the data exchanges and the needs that are there for each project. As those projects are approved and, more importantly, funded, they move into the project module of Fusion. And in addition to the project level details that were developed in the plans, that, that can also be maintained in the project module, there's also a set of, set of workflow elements that allow the districts to submit financial reimbursement claims that uh, allow them to generate quarterly reports and uh, submit change requests for review by the state for state funded projects. As, that, as those projects are built out, and they're occupied, they're then added to the space inventory and the cycle continues. So all of this information is going on in Fusion for 71 million square feet of space. The, the capital plans are covering five years of, of plans with, you know, I'm talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in capital plans that are, are flowing through the system um, all the time. And if you think of that workflow and of that data repository in the context of the uh, facility life cycle, from master planning to, to maintenance and energy monitoring, the data infusion is key to activities across that life cycle. And it's been a goal of Fred Harris and the Chancellor's Office and myself to continue to look for new ways that we can take that repository of data that we maintain for these annual reporting requirements, but make it available to the districts in flexible ways so they can use it for other activities across the life cycle. So if you park that idea in a moment and think about all that facility data sitting there waiting to be tied into other activities, I'd like to introduce you to the next pillar component here that, that adds uh, so much uh, juice to the, to the uh, program. And that's the GIS system. In 2006, I was approached by researchers at the districts interested in developing a geographical information system um, portal and server system that would be available to give uniform geospatial data to all of the districts. Because I was also involved in the facilities realm, I immediately saw a, 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 an opportunity for a tie there. And what we have in the CCC GIS Collaborative is a whole series of geospatial layers that can be mixed and combined. It started with developing district boundary layers developed from, from legal documents. Uh, I had a very patient team going over surveyors and legal documents to, to develop these polygons. And then we have campus, uh, campus locations. We have the ability to, to uh, use all sorts of demographic data either from public sources or we subscribe on behalf of the districts, look at things like population dynamics. We can look at high school graduation rates at the K-12 districts in and around our districts to give a sense of what, what uh, student needs are going to be in the future. We can look at enrollment demographics. In our case, this is a plot of age distribution of students by zip code, looking at where young students and older students are coming from into our campuses. As we get closer to the campus itself, we can look at, at local regional uh, a local area activities, such as seismic hazards, flood hazards, fire hazards, things that are more directly tied to the master planning elements. And on the campus itself, we, can look, we have campus boundaries, and we have building footprints. All of this creates this geospatial scaffolding to which we can attach the, the fusion data. In addition, we, have, uh, we are hosting infrastructure data uh, for a few campuses to one, one Key campus right now has this level of data, and other campuses have summary, more summary information. But we have the ability to host uh, this infrastructure data uh, for, for use in all sorts of master planning activities. So the Enuma system then comes along, and it becomes the integrator that helps us bring the Fusion and the GIS system together without us having to develop our own major applications on top of the work we've already done. It allows us to take a model of an individual building or an entire campus, such as we did for Delta College when we first were uh, piloting this work. You combine, we can combine it with not only the fusion data, but from data elements from all sorts of other sources. We've got enrollment data. The, the Chancellor's Office has a data mark. And, and this is the research community that came to me asking about GIS Collaborative. The data mark has enrollment data for 2 million students going back more than a decade. We can recombine that, and we have and we have enrollments by the zip codes the students report that they're coming from. 
we can tie into applications like Brevet. We can tie into local district tools, contractor building um, documents, all manner of topics. And that allows us to create these models that identify on the campus, in the building, individual spaces with a whole range of data. I know you can't possibly read the elements of the data, but, but these are data attributes that are attributed to a specific space in the new math and science building at Delft College. And in this way, we can get these rich, visual, intuitive displays of information about our facilities. We take the fusion data, we attach it to these geospatial models, and then we attach it to the, to the BIM and the reporting tools in ANUMA, and we have this, this rich mashup of information coming from multiple tools. So altogether, if you think of the Fusion GIS and UMA platform and the Fusion data against the life cycle, this collaborative platform we've created is facilitator, a wrapper around the life cycle and the data that makes that data available across, across the entire life cycle. And we are able to take those three independently running platforms but create this collaborative platform that then opens the door for many other data sets, software applications, vendors, service providers to link into and provide the districts uh, a whole range of activities that would otherwise be more difficult for them to, to uh, manage. The next few slides are taken from the Enuma site, but I, I, I use them as a prelude to some of the topics Kimono will talk about to give you a sense of how we build up the data layers here uh, in the Enuma system itself. We're going to start with a background image coming from who else but Google. We have a Google satellite image, that, and in this case, we're looking at the Miracosta Community College near San Diego. Our first step is to add some GIS layers. The red line, which I'm sure is hard to see from the back, is the campus boundary. The, the dark polygons are the building footprints. Both of those are coming from my GIS team. Through Enuma, then, we link those geospatial footprints to the fusion data and then can use the Enuma features to read the fusion data and use it to color code the display. So for instance, imagine that the purple buildings were the buildings on the campus that were identified in my facility condition assessor's visit as buildings needing new roofs, or new carpets, or all of the science labs on the campus. <coughs> to that, we can then add, mass, we can add planning activity that may not be in fusion yet. These may be preliminary plans that aren't yet in the planning module. We can add those layers. And still, we can continue to add geo geospatial infrastructure data. And while this mashup is too much to digest all by uh, all together, it, it's difficult to see on the slide, but there's a series of checkboxes across the right-hand side. And those would uh, allow a user to go in and turn on and off the layers they wish so that they can narrow in. If they just want to know where fire hydrants are, they can, they can turn off all the other layers except fire hydrants. And in this way, we, we and we can even take that map then and burrow into individual buildings. So the prior, prior view was of a campus. Now we're looking inside a building. We can look at these, these uh, intuitive color-coded displays that help us digest information quickly. And then we can also use those same color-coded displays in the Enuma platform to generate reports. So we can, we can take information in Fusion. We can combine it with data sets from other elements of the district. We can look, look at it in an intuitive way, and then we can spit out reports that combine data from those multiple sets. You know, so so we're, we're, we're recombining data on the fly in order to answer specific questions as, as we go. So how, how are my districts using this now? We, we, as Kim on started, stated earlier, we talked about doing this for two campuses, and he said, oh, let's do the whole state. So we, did, we had the Fusion database. We imported it all. We created an initial. Uh, 5,000 plus models of buildings. They were simple stacking diagrams in most cases. I had six districts that wanted to be the part of an initial demonstration project. And they, they spent a little bit of money and, and developed models of individual uh, buildings, or in one case, a small campus. Since then, and then we shared that information. And, and since then, we've had four districts uh, adopting this platform as the main vehicle they're going to use for communicating and reporting on the master plan. So instead of creating a static master planning document that uh, I often call, call a doorstop, they're going to create a dynamic 
web application or a web set of web pages that can live with the master plan as it evolves. And it can act, in fact, for the campus, it will evolve from being a master planning document to being both a planning document and a campus um, maintenance reporting tool, tracking tool. We've had three districts use the Fusion GIS and UMA platform for energy assessments, two of them using pre existing assessment data, one of them is working specifically in the platform to tie energy in. We have uh, three buildings at, at different campuses that are taking nearly completed buildings that were nearly complete before we, we integrated the systems, and they're importing that Revit, the, the detailed BIM, into Fusion JS and UMA in order to prepare for using the facility maintenance when the construction is finished. We have other campuses, especially those involved in the master planning, that are taking space inventory information from Fusion that's, that's visible in Anuma for aging buildings that are to be replaced or to be modernized. They can go into the space inventory information we have, extract that information as a report, pass that space inventory information with all the linked Fusion attributes, pass it to their architect, and have that be the basis for the development of the detailed design. So they, they've, we, in doing that, we've, we've been able to save the architects from having to re-key a bunch of information that we already have, and we have the district's update annually. We have a, a campus in Southern California that's looking at room sensors and looking at, at hot and cold water income and, and using the sensors and, and being able to visualize what's going on with those sensors for that system in the Enuma platform. And we have districts uh, and vendors talking to us about a whole range of activities to, to integrate with this platform, CMMS, enterprise uh, resource planning tools, facility maintenance, job ticketing, class scheduling, asset management. I, many, of these, many of these goals have been already um, articulated. Why does it work? Uh, the, the reason all of this works is because we're starting with the data we have. We're not getting obsessed with, with having everything we need up front all at once. We're starting where we can, and we're, sh we're allowing the data to reside in, the, its, in its source location. But we're sharing the data through web links. And in order to do that, we need to, to insist on using common open data standards. For data exchange, we're using XML, REST services, SOAP services. Uh, for architecture and, G and GIS, we're using industry-specific standards for naming so that we all are speaking a common language when we're, when we're having information exchange between these different data sets. We focus on keeping our platform simple and intuitive so that it's easy to navigate and, navigate and easy to extract the information you want, but then we're partnering with people to, uh, to develop the advanced tools and advanced features that are, are important to individual elements in our community fellowship, our community. So in that way, we've been able to take this fusion data, make it available across the life cycle with our collaboration platform. With that, I'll turn it back to Kamon. And while he sets up, I'm also happy to answer any questions. No, it, it's simpler than that. The question was, if I have a data set or a tool, and I would like to be part of this collaborative effort. I'd like to be able to provide my services or make my data available to my fellow districts. How do I do it? Do I develop web services to talk to all three of these systems? The answer is no. The idea, the, my intent, is that Enuma becomes the integrator for that. In this case, we have a room in the middle, and everything is to a room, not to a That That is correct. I, you, you can come look at the arrows and we can talk all you want. I, mean, I think that's, an, that's a semantic argument. The, the point is, I, don't, I have very limited resources in a public environment that's ex extremely constrained. I don't want to be a bottleneck to development by saying that it has to be my staff that develop the services. My staff develop services because I've chosen Enuma to be that integrator. But that's so that I can provide services more quickly to my district. It's as simple as that. Let me expand on that a little bit. One interesting thing here, the reason that we put that other line in, I kind of remember, this was kind of a conceptual slide, mm -hmm. but the concept of web services, is even though Onuma is right there right now, we want our future competitors to come in and replace us if we need to, because this is all built on open standards. The only reason we're going through Onuma right now is because of the convenience factor that it, that it works. Uh, but in the future, other systems can go directly to Fusion if you decide to do that. 
right? The other very interesting dynamic that develops with this approach is we've had tons of other vendors, software vendors, come in and say, we, we have web services we want to connect. You don't even have to go out and say, we have open standards, we want to do this. As an owner of this site, you just have to declare, I have lots of data about facilities. I'm looking for scheduling software. I'm looking for CMS. I'm looking for other DIM applications. I'm looking for Kobe data, Kobe tools, whatever it might be. And they're just coming out of the woodwork, which is great. It's fantastic. And uh, it, it starts to, to it churns and, and rapidly accelerates development. That's why we were able to. It's not even been a year now, actually, I don't think, right? Well, actually, it's probably about a year. It's March. March was our, our, March was our launch. Launch of the 72 month, the model to build the entire state. Right. March 11th. We were having meetings every week now, literally, with different software vendors. So the invitation to the industry is we're looking for others to come and connect to that, wherever you may be, whether you're a vendor, whether you're an architect like VVN who has latched in and say, I can use this data to do the master plan, and here's how I'm going to do it. And Rob's going to talk a little about that too. But it's very exciting because it's, it's the important thing is just to get started because we can sit there, and I'm very much involved in building smart and I support the standards development there, but sometimes I'm very frustrated that we can't sit there and talk about what the future is going to be like without actually jumping in and doing it, and failing in some cases and moving on. Otherwise, we're just stuck in this kind of constant discussion cycle about what it can be. Another question? Yes. How do you deal with the issue of, I'm assuming you have an issue to some extent of security. There are some parts of this information you probably rather not everybody know or shouldn't know. So how do you deal with that? The, we, Fusion itself was developed with that in mind. The question was, how do we deal with security issues and access issues to different data sets? And Fusion was designed specifically so that the districts each identify a local administrator from their district to assign users. So they can choose their local staff or their contractors, whomever they wish to have access to their Fusion data. They often call us and ask if we're going to add a user or they're all right, add a user, and that's what my team is there for. But the intent is to pass that authority to the local district. Because early on, they were, they were sensitive to this idea of having we have very strong, uh, fiercely independent districts. I heard from somebody else that the comment was made about Sutter being a confederacy of hospitals. I often use the phrase that we have a confederacy of 72 districts, and that's, that's one of the key strengths that we have in the system, because we can innovate. It also can be a hindrance, because it can be hard to get everybody to agree at, at the same time. One of the key elements that came out of those early discussions in Fusion was, let's let each district manage their facility they in Fusion. And then my team works with with the this platform to then make sure the permissions that are in and in the match the, the future just for that reason. And, and, and we and then we control you know we control the spigot for, for the fusion data. So the, the data that my districts own and they're very progressive of, we can we can readily manage. We give them the tools to manage themselves or we can help them do it. Paul? Just quickly. Um, Fusion, I assume, is not going to be available in the That's right. Fusion, Fusion was developed specifically by and for community developers. Right? And what does somebody else want to do? Then I need to take a, an idea to my steering committee and, and give them a chance to think about it. I think there is an opportunity for that at some point. At some point uh, I would be interested in finding another higher ed institution or an organization that had uh, processes similar to ours. Uh, right now, all of our configuration is built around the forms and the workflow that community projects have. So the thing that would need to be added would be configurability services. It's a politically sensitive topic within the community college. It's a, it's a topic that come up with Fred Harris is giving that question to ask. Sure. Uh, one interesting thing about that question is, in concept, we could have taken all the fusion data and imported it into a minimum very similar functionality. We wouldn't have had all the other stuff that Fusion can do. And that would be a typical response in a project if you say, we want to manage our data, we say, great, let's put it all in the NAND system. That would not be as valuable as doing it with we are today. So the thing that just astounded us when we first saw Fusion is the fact that they had a standard already established for space that most owners, as we don't know, it's a very difficult thing to establish at baseline level. Spaces, buildings, condition, all that stuff. And we just and there was GIS as well. So we said this is like a perfect mix to combine the <coughs> and GIS with a tool set. Gives an opportunity. 
that. And because Fusion has to be updated annually, it's fresh. It's fresh, It's yeah. always perfect. Yeah. It's always a problem because we're constantly dealing, I'm not going to name it, but <laughs> import, export, what version are we dealing with? Oh, that's version whatever. It's impossible to deal, to scale what we're trying to achieve here with the tools that we're using from the 20th, 20th century. It's just absolutely impossible. This is, this is a view of where it can go, and this is literally just the tip of the iceberg. But what would happen if an other owner, and a lot of owners already have structured data in some format, it's very, and we've worked with other owners in similar ways too, you basically do the same thing. You either prototype and go to another set of database and connect to it, or you have a system, you have the discussion, okay, you have data in XYZ tool. Does XYZ tool allow open connections in and out? And unfortunately, a lot of proprietary tools in the past were very closed, but now that the discussion is coming forward, it starts opening things up, and yes, they can open up. It's not, it's technically it's not a challenge. I see two more, two more questions that I imagine well, we can decide how we want to move from there. Yeah, we'll continue. So, let's, let's just a really quick sense. It seems like a new and maybe the portal to the cloud gate, going back to the question of security, that seems like a good, a good access point for somebody we don't want that day to be. How does a new portal work? Okay. Um, but, but Fusion and GIS are, all three are web based. Right. There, there is a, obviously, if you're on the web, you have to have security. Place. And every transaction we make, when you push a button, it's a secure transaction, just like the banks use. It's actually more secure to work this way than to run around with a laptop with a BIM of the Pentagon or whatever it might be. As we all know, that happens, things get lost. We've actually used this on the Homeland Security headquarters. But a lot of government agencies are very security conscious, so it becomes a big media that just cuts off, and which creates a less secure environment because you're, you're going around and doing things different ways. So I think it's an important discussion, but it actually allows us to hone in and say, person A only has access to room B and nothing else. They might not even get access to the floor plan of the building if we don't want to give them access. So they can say, go bid the carpet in this conference room and not know that the conference room is in the Pentagon. Versus here's a bin or here's a CAD file or here's whatever with all the information in it. And that opens up more security. But it's, it's a very important discussion. The, the, the districts are all responsible for updating their own space in, the, in capital. So the, it, it is up to the diligence of the, of the campus to submit it, and then up to the chancellor's office to review and approve it. Uh, there, are, there are errors in any space in the And I know we have those, but that's a procedural problem that, that if we encourage the chancellor's office to find the resources they need to review the space in the wherever they need to, but, but the basic the question. We, we don't have the, the, the assessment, on the assessment side, we do keep that up, updated, and that's, and that's part of the assessment for the reviews. But on the, the space in the they, they don't need to be able to specifically. They're, they're worrying about changes in their in your academic room use assignments. Uh, square footage changes the fire marshal has indicated to change the number of seats they can have or do have in space. All right, thanks, John. And I'll go a few more minutes here and we'll take a few more questions if we need to. Um, so what I'm going to show now is a live version of what John described. So I'm live on the web right now. I'm logged into one campus and if you look at, um, let's see, this right here, this is a view of all 120,000 spaces, 5,000 buildings, state of California, each dot is a campus. You click on a dot, you click on a building, here are all the buildings, I click on an IFC file. It creates an IFC file on the fly. From If there's an assessor out in the field collecting data that's going to end up in the IFC file, it actually builds the IFC file. When I click this, it downloads an IFC file on the fly that can be taken into other tools. So that's, that's one part of the, the real-time data there. The other part is when I get to the campus level, so this is uh, Miracosta College in Oceanside. Uh, important point here is all of these names of the buildings, this is, uh, we're in the Onuma system now. The actual name of the building is coming from the Fusion server. I'm not even allowed to change the name of the building. Red flags will go up if I start, you know, even the names of the spaces. When I drill down into the space, it's the same thing because 
Fusion owns the name of the space, and the number of the space, and what's also called a path, I forgot the name, path ID? Path ID. Path ID, which is another unique ID in the background. So if somebody changes the room number, which came up earlier, room number or room name, we still know we're talking about that block that's in that building that now we're reassigning things to. So it's important to have multiple layers of data that you can start managing it like that. Okay, so that's the, name, the naming of the building. I have the right, I'm, I'm in view mode, so I can't edit any data. I can view data, I can pull up information about the building. If I'm logged in with the right username and password, I can then start going into edit mode and start moving things around. So each user knows who I am and what data I'm touching and what I'm allowed to even see or edit and who's sharing that information with me or who I'm sharing it out to. And the other thing on the right, this is called a mashup. So we have the, the blue buildings are coming from Onuma. The names of the buildings are coming from Fusion. The background JPEG is coming from a scan from a master plan that was done in PDF that we brought in as a reference point. The buildings that are coming from an ArcGIS server, the CCC GIS system, are coming again from the Foundations server. So I can say, okay, show me, um, let's go back to the blank site here. Show me the buildings and the GIS data that comes from, from that server. So it's going and hitting the server now, pulling up information from the GIS system and bringing it in. So you have massive amounts of data at your fingertips in an interface like this or on an iPad. We'll show it in a few minutes here. So there comes the GIS data. The GIS data was sitting in a CAD file, and as part of the BIM storm, John's team said, we'll take that GIS data and actually park it on our server because if it's sitting in some file somewhere, only the people that have access to that file have access to that information. So it, it, it increases the value of the information that's used for planning. There's an immense amount of data just coming in. And if somebody's, whoever owns that information about the utility line, if they change that, then I have access to it as a planner in this case. Uh, the other one is the uh, facility condition of the building. So let's turn off the uh, map view for a second here and just go to show me the deficiency information. This is from the assessment data. <coughs> So I say, show me what, which, which buildings have plumbing fixtures that are failing. Again, level of detail concept here. If I want to know which plumbing fixture is failing, unless I'm going to go in and want to look at it and see how it's, which is valuable too, but it's not always what you need to say, turn buildings red that have plumbing issues. And what, what kind of plumbing issues do they have? You click on the building and you, you drill down into that information. If you want to keep going into it, you say, go, okay, let's go into that. Click on the Fusion tab, pull up the deficiencies. Now it's hitting, this is our Onuma interface again too, but hitting the Onuma, I mean the Fusion server, pulling up the deficiency data and the dollar amounts for those deficiencies that assessment teams are updating. Here's the facility condition. This is an engineering report that was translated into, uh, to show where they can do energy savings, etc. I know we're giving you kind of a, it's a huge amount of information we're kind of dumping on you here. The most important point is no single user is going to touch every single one of these interfaces. It's like nobody goes and looks at the whole internet. It depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, if I go into the building now and I look at what's called the Fusion top codes and the program codes, these are classifications of space based on Fusion standards. So if I click on a space, go into Fusion here, it actually has... Oh, and go and let's say I have the right to edit. I'm going to go back into edit mode. Not everybody has a right to edit a classification of a space, but let's say I'm going in and, and changing that. I go into edit mode and I say, okay, that's the wrong classification. We're finding this over and over again. When we start taking tabular data and connecting it to graphics, you notice anomalies across the board. Every single building has some kind of anomaly in data because you can't catch it in a tabular format. That's just the nature of tabular data. So if we go in here and say, well, this is not really that classification, let's go in and change it. This pull down here is the interface is in the Onuma system. The actual pick list, as it's called, or the pull down is coming from the Fusion server through web services. I'm saying, give me your latest classifications. I don't have to go and get an Excel file with last year's and this year's and that year's. You basically, it's like making that airline reservation. It doesn't say LAX Z, it says LAX when you pull down. And the flight schedule is coming from Delta because they have del flights that go here. They can't fly to, to um, certain cities. So it's, it's all an interconnected network. And it's not one server. It's not one system. Just like the Internet is not one server. If you think of this as a distributed network of information through web services, this scales infinitely because that's how the Internet works. This is not a technology that we're making up here. It's already been around for many years. Okay, so a few things as we finish up here. Um, I want to show... 
what else can you do with this? Let's see. Let me get to the space plan. Okay. This company, this is a Glendale Community College. There was a building automation system vendor that was putting in sensors in this building. And they had a, a this is actually a demonstration room, so I can actually mess with it. But this is a room with a camera in it. I've logged in with my username and password. And there's a light there. If I click on the light and look, and this is in the Onuma system. This interface is in the Onuma system, but it's going through web services to, I don't even know where the server is, where this resides, that's managing this building automation system. And I'm going to say I want to turn off that light. And I have to have a password, obviously. I can't do this without a password. And it's sending a message from the bin on the Onuma system, linking it there. The reason this works is because they use the same room numbers that were in Fusion. So we're talking about the same room with that same sensor. And is that your interface? No, this is not our interface. This is somebody else's interface. There, it's basically just embedded through. Yeah, and the same thing with the fan. So this is this is endless. The intent here is not to go through and manage lights for buildings all one by one. But if you get into demand response and energy management, knowing what that space is being used for, what the condition of the space is, what the master planners are talking about, what the school district wants to do, then you can start making intelligent decisions of what you do with this with these files. Uh, Bob, why don't you come up and say a few words here, and I'll open up. <coughs> Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rob Barthelman. I'm a principal with Architecture VDN. Um, as John and Kimon were just saying, we're involved in several master plans at different districts in the California system. Uh, and as we started to look at what, what was needed out there, a common story we were hearing in a lot of the more recent construction and renovation was that my board doesn't get it. But we've, we've got all these brand new facilities, but they won't tear down the old stuff. I've got six guys on this campus. And now we've got 120,000 more square feet. How do I maintain that? Well, the, the answer of anybody would be, well, we've got more space. We can't maintain it. But there's no data behind that. Any board member can say, well, yeah, but Joe down the street here in his neighborhood is saying, you can't tear down that capital. We paid for that. So the district needed this data that was going to help them with decisions. And as we started to think about this in our master planning of districts that have bond money from public bonds. They needed data that was going to be able to go, we're proposing this project because it will reduce the maintenance costs. You'll have a return on investment of energy. Our water's gonna be less. We need half the people to maintain it because we've put materials in it that require less maintenance. We started to put all this together and as we started to talk to Kimon and, and the foundation, we found that we had this tool with all this data that we could bring together, again, through, through the viewpoint of Onuma as something that would allow us to collaborate with all that information that we could bring assessment information in. We could tie to what the foundation had now. We can go out and look at the facilities now and update that information, bring it to the campuses. We can provide some information about the finishes that are in the rooms themselves and say, hey, there's carpet in this room, and I can go to a plan just like this, say, show me the rooms that have carpet. Now imagine putting to that also that it costs $1.50 each day to maintain that carpet. And you multiply that across every room on campus that has carpet, and you can start to realize, wow, we really should be putting concrete in here that we can just sweep up at the end of the day rather than carpet because it costs 30 cents a day to clean it. We can start to make some really smart decisions with our districts. And that's what we're bringing forward to them now uh, at Solano, at College of Marin. And the stories are the same. We need something that helps us to compare that, compare that information. You stop me at any time here. I'm going to just keep on going. Keep going one, one um, little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> but we're really excited about this. Because as architects, and you come in and you, you say, we've got this great idea. Well, you're an architect. You just want the big design. You want the, that's not where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm in the same boat with these guys. We need to share information that helps to lead to the right decision. The design is a piece of that as well. And boy, if we could put data to that too that says, we're bringing more students to a space or an external space, or students are hanging out in this this pod or this classroom because the furniture that's here or all that stuff starts to generate data that starts to tell the district, you need to spend more money on creating spaces like this. That, that's powerful information. Um, the space planning is something that we've been involved with some of our campuses as well. They say, we're going to tear down this building, but as we tear down this building, we need a place to put them when we build the new one. Okay, well, bring up the plan. Show me that you've got spaces that are 900 square feet, 600 square feet, have stations of 23, 45, 50. Where are you going to put them? Okay, well, show me all the spaces on campuses that are 400 square feet and have 33 stations. Boom, 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 boom. They light up. Show me the ones that are available at 2 o'clock. Boom, 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 boom. They light up. 
that's the type of information we want to be able to show our campuses and our districts so that we can say, we can take information that otherwise you'd be sitting down and go, okay, well, we can try to move that here. But when we go to their scheduling software, when we tie it into the, uh, the fusion data on the rooms that are there, tie it into additional data that may be coming from third or fourth parties, we can start to make really smart decisions like that. Um, we've been talking with uh, PG&E uh, for the campuses that we're working on about providing us the energy data itself. What are the costs that these districts are incurring monthly? So we can start to look at each building itself. You know, imagine, too, and I don't know where your facilities are, but community colleges usually have, they have one meter. They may have 25 buildings, they have one meter. Well, when you start to tell them, boy, if you break that down by each building, or you start to break it down into plug loads and mechanical loads, and you start to be able to analyze like this, Solano is running out and buying all these devices that can clamp onto their electrical so they can start telling that story and saying, we're burning this much energy in this building, and boy, if we replace this mechanical system, which will have this type of electrical demand versus the one we currently have, we can save so much money. The Board of Trustees can say, yes, we understand why you're undertaking that project, or go to the public and say, we're going to be able to spin something back to you that's going to take your bond monies that you're approving for us and put them to good use to reduce our operating costs and put them back into teaching students. When we're coming from Solano today, they just cut their summer programs because they can't afford to teach summer. Well, you tell them they can reduce their energy costs, put some of that money back into teaching, that means something to that Board of Trustees. And so this data is going to help to do that. So that's a, a lot of that. I don't know if you want to jump in here, too. But the one more thing I'll, I'll just throw out there, and then Kimon can jump in to share uh, some of the samples we're doing. This is this Kobe side. Um, at the College of Marin, they've got a brand new building that's under construction right now. And as we came into this, they are saying the same thing. You know, here's another 70,000 square feet, and it's got our central plant in it, too. We don't know what we're going to need to maintain it. We're going to get a pile of binders and maintenance and operations and warranties. And we're sitting there going, well, you got a contractor on board. The design team's still there. We can start to fill that information into a spreadsheet now. Who's, who, is it a train unit? Uh, what size is it? What are the filters? How often does it need to be changed? All of that can start to go into databases now. And we're helping them on a pilot project so they can see the benefit of that and they can start to implement it on the rest of their campus and their buildings. We're doing that on an existing building, too. So we're going to take an existing building, run around, take the photos we'll show you in a second, the assessment side of this, be able to document what's actually in the field and what those requirements are in an existing building, too. They're going to have two pilots. What's it take to take a new building and analyze it, what it takes to maintain that building from the finishes to the mechanical systems, operationally, as well as the, the, the person power that it takes to clean and maintain it, and then an existing building, too. And in the existing building, it's just been that story of, well, we've got 30-year-old mechanical units, no kidding, that are still in the building with ductwork that's running underneath the building and all sorts of horror stories about the inefficiencies of it, and tell them a story that says, well, that's what you've got now and the cost that you have because we're going to start to monitor that electrical load, too. And we tell them that if you put this into the building, you're going to save these kind of monies. That's what we're providing to our clients now. And as an architect, that's, that's what's exciting to me. It's not just the beautiful design thing, and that's, that's why I got into architecture. But when you can look at and provide a client with something that is from the concept of something through to its operations, and they can hold it up, and everybody can constantly say, yes, that's why we're going forward with that project. I get excited about that, and I know that our, our clients do too. Great. Thanks, Rob. One significant thing of what BBN has been doing is basically before they're starting all this work, they're starting with the fusion data, the building data, and delivering their deliverable back in the format that can feed back the fusion. It seems like a sim simple challenge, but it's always a problem when engineering data comes in and has different room numbers. Okay, how do you know which room you're talking about? What Rob was talking about was this assessment tool. We built, this is going back to the, we're all going to be software developers, we're all going to create apps. We've created hundreds of apps on, on, iPad, on iPads, on iPhones, whatever. And this was actually just created in the last couple of weeks specifically for the assessment that's being done there. So Rob went to his engineers and said, the engineers are saying, we're going to go out with clipboards and Word documents and do checkboxes. And he said, no, we're going to take your pick list and we're going to give you an iPad and you're going to go to the field and collect this data. And as you're feeding this data in here, it's feeding it back into the server, it's feeding it back, and could feed it back into Fusion if you want to push it back in as a deliverable back there. Okay. Were you going to show us something right here with your science uh, yeah, we actually have an uh, iPad app that is the Marin, uh, Miracosta campus basically coming from our uh, Onuma system. 
into an iPad with the same data and room numbers and everything like that. So this, this is the kind of stuff you can start taking out the field and giving a specific interface to a user like an engineer that's going to go into check box of assessments. Or whatever. The key again is that we're not importing, exporting, we're subscribing to that data that's coming out. Which the question is, uh, since it's being subscribed, which elements are here that you don't need to have that subscription to that data? And still run. And still run. The answer is, any of this data that we showed you can be pulled into other applications, into BIM, or into an Excel, or into another database, or into Revit, or whatever, and you could work offline, or even into an iPad. We have two versions of the iPad, one that says, go live, another one that says, grab the data, I'm going underground and collecting data, and coming back and synchronizing it. So for, in disaster situations, yeah, when the internet starts cutting off, obviously it's an issue. Uh, but that's just the nature of how that works. But we, it's not one or the other. You can actually work both ways. And we, we've thought about that quite a bit. And we've gone through quite a few workflows of how to deal with that. Um, in fact, we worked with the, uh, uh, the Red Cross and uh, the Bay Area cities, starting with San Francisco, creating using this as an interface to manage shelters, emergency shelters. And they actually wanted the data to reside outside of the <coughs> Bay Area. So it's in a server outside of the Bay Area. So if something happens, it's still accessible, that type of thing. Yeah, the question is, is, is this intended to supplement or complement the BAS system? Depends on the owner. We have some owners that we, we, we are working that have existing BAS systems in them. We're not, we're not the, the team that actually does this, works with the sensors. We have other partners that we work with. So they either connect to the, it depends again on how open that system is. So there's some owners that basically bypass the existing systems or other owners that want to connect to the existing systems. It becomes a discussion point because a lot of the older Proprietary systems are very difficult, it's even still, to get data in and out. But, again, we need to kind of demand as owners, we need to access our data in a neutral format so we can do things like this. But it's, it's, it's a transition period, it's kind of a hybrid approach right now. Okay. Break time? All right, thank you very much. Thank you.